This was a nice presentation to do because right now I'm working on the Mesoamerican and indigenous legal systems throughout history, since pre-Hispanic times up all the way up to the 20th century. So this was a very good uh, opportunity for a reflection on my part. And I'll try to mix some of my recent experiences on this field about this uh, two-phase divided Mexico, this genus of a nation in which the two sides of the same coin are deep Mexico with the ancient heritage of a Mesoamerican tradition, indigenous Native American tradition, as against a more Western-oriented imaginary Mexico, as Von Thiel called it. Mexico Profundo had a very quick influence in most Mexican circles. It was published relatively recently in 1987 and attained a classic status as a text very soon afterwards, especially, I would say, after the Ejército Zapatista revolted in 1994 and suddenly what Bonfil had said all along that there was a, con a fundamental contradiction between this Western-oriented Mexico, imaginary Mexico, and the deep Mexico, the Mexico Profundo, existed. And so suddenly, by 1994, which was just at the end of the Carlos de Salinas, Carlos Salinas de Gortari's presidential period, this became acutely obvious that there was a contradiction that the modernizing plans which had been spearheaded by Salinas were kind of uh, disassociated from most of the uh, most Mexican population. Also, many of the Bonfils observations are valid still today. His second preface, just after the 1988 uh, elections, which were considered as rigged and with widespread fraud, hold also true today after the 2006 elections, which were even more hotly contested and even, even less legitimate from a social standpoint. Mexico Profundo also can be seen as a high watermark for Mexican anthropological thinking. The Mexican anthropological school developed quite strongly since the 20s and 30s, directly linked with the revolutionary ideology. We had a profoundly nationalist and combative uh, party, which has been alternately seen, been seen like capitalist by the left, as leftist by the right, and which I think could be characterized quite well as nearly fascist, because you have a highly authoritarian regime with a single party that organized everything inside in a hierarchical way. So, this anthropology was uh, practice-oriented, pragmatically-oriented to sol for solving Mexican problems, and which was the main problem related to anthropology. Exactly. The Indian population. So, Mexican anthropology basically studied Indians, not urban context until the late 80s. And thus, Bonfils uh, text can be seen kind of a re uh, condensation of most of uh, anthropological thinking up till then, but also highly critical 
of many of the things that had been done and projects that had been developed. Which are these influences? Everyone, everybody read the text? Mm -hmm. Okay. The first big influence is indigenismo, the Mexican tradition of studying the Indian population, making good monographic uh, work with them, and gradually integrating uh, in the Indian population with two great differences. Up to the 50s, this was a Western-oriented integration where Indian customs were to be preserved only if they did not clash with Western values. For instance, the legal systems, for instance, religious practices, and were thus being seen as basically anachronistic, atavistic, and not very useful. But starting from the 50s, the later school, the early school was characterized by Gamio, Vasconcelos, Caso, the elder Caso, and the younger generation was led by the younger Caso, by Aguirre Beltran, by Bonfil Batalla himself. And here the emphasis was on empowering Indian communities, gradually incorporating Indian communities through economic development which is not all that bad because by the 50s the Indian population had become, uh, using Aguirre Beltran's phrase, the poorest of the poor and there were, an Indian identity was not very clear cut in those uh, days. The second big influence is the theory of mestizaje. Mestizaje, the mixing of race, was adopted as the Mexican banner, ideological banner, even earlier, probably since colonial times. The Virgin of Guadalupe cult is a direct reflection of a mestizo culture, a, a symbol developed from a local uh, cult, very local, to national proportions precisely because it was very useful for colonial elites and colonial uh, groups that were interested both in independence and in acquiring greater power inside the colony. This is so clear that the most popular virgin cult in central Mexico was not for the Indian population was not the Virgin of Guadalupe. It was the Virgin de los Remedios, very nearby also. And the clash became so acute that during the independence movement, the insurgents fought with the, the Virgin of Guadalupe as a banner, and the conservatives or royalists fought with the uh, would stand the banners of the Virgen de los Remedios and each one shot the other one. When, whenever they captured a uh, standard, they shot the other virgin. So this was quite clear for early Mexicans. Of course, this marks a very different approach to race and race relations as compared with Argentina, the US, or even Brazil, which have very different outlooks. Mexico, based on a big percentage of Indian population, when the independence uh, was attained, it was about 85% Indian population. Today it is between 10 and 15, depending on who's counting and how they're counting. More, more, in this, more about this later. But the idea was to make a single unit, a national unit, by considering everyone equal. But as Bonfil rightly points, and to use Orwell's original formula, everyone 
is equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> the third uh, important influence is the idea of a deep Mexico, of something more profound that is at the base of uh, Mexico, and that most Mexican man cultural, political, and economic manifestations and phenomena are really masking a deeper reality. This deeper reality has been studied since <coughs> the 19th century, and some of the most important works include Samuel Ramos, Rodolfo Sigli, and, of course, Octavio Paz's El Laberinto de la Soledad, which are all essays destined to explain this uh, contraposition between different cultures and also how Mexico is really faking it. Usigli uh, would say faking it, uh, el gesticulador, making, acting as another character. Of course, there's another side to Mexico Profundo. It is well written, very easy to read, and thus is quite apart from most anthropological books, especially archaeological books in which my colleagues basically describe a series of shirts or stones, and thus are not read by anyone, let alone the general public, but even specialists can hardly swallow an, an archaeological report. This sets it apart completely because, like Laberinto de la Soledad or Sam Ramos's work, it is very well written and thus had a big impact upon its readers. Who's Guillermo Bonfil? He was born in 1935 and died very young in 1991 when he was probably at the peak of his uh, capacities. He was, he studied anthropology at uh, the National School of Anthropology where he also taught and worked all his life both at INA, Instituto Nacional de Antropología, and as a public servant, director of a series of institutions. The most important uh, was probably his founding of the Museo de Culturas Populares. Academically, he was a bit apart from most of his colleagues. Most Mexican anthropologists, even the most famous ones, began by producing a series of very focalized uh, monographies, local monographies, and then gradually escalated towards political interpretations and applying uh, the greater uh, anthropological knowledge towards solving specific national problems. This would be the case with uh, Alfonso Caso, with Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran, but Bonfil liked theory and he was also highly critical from the start. If you see here, even his early publications are, have already the seed of social critique and academic criticism also. As you see here also, many of his ideas as ethno-development and 